Kings gave you all this stuff and you um, all knew that and yeah, the Lord still took you you know, over part of this stuff so the Lord and I would like to welcome you to my senior lecture recital, the viola and its solo repertoire through the musical eras. My name is Thomas Cass, and I am a senior here at the University of Lynchburg, and I have a guest performer, Mr. Rick Smallshaw, who is over there and will be joining me for one of the pieces, and also my accompanist, Mrs. Rachel Gowinski. So now, you may be thinking, viola, what in the world is that? It's not just the mini cello, Oh, so you mean you play the violin, right? Ew, your instrument's the worst. Why would you ever do that to yourself? The cello just sounds so much better. You should switch and insert the other 10,000 viola bashing jokes I've ever heard in my life. But you know what? It's fine because I love this instrument to death. And I feel like this pie chart over here best explains everything. So this yellow part is, you mean the violin? The next part is, what's that? And then the other one right next to it is, I've heard of that before. And then the smallest one is when you get into violas and it's, oh, I actually love the viola. So jokes and memes aside, what on earth is it? Well, in a nutshell, it is this piece of torture right here. I'm just kidding. Uh, it is a four-stringed instrument. Its, range, its size range can be anywhere between 12 and 18 inches long. The strings are tuned to C3, G3, D4, and A4. The players read an alto and treble clef. And violas are actually interestingly sized by measuring the reverse side length from the side of the button to the center line at the base. And basically all that you need to know about that is that they're measured differently than violins, so that's one way that we're different as well. <laughs> And fun fact, violas of 16 inches and up are classified as large sized and are the most suitable instrument sizes for adults. Mine is 16 and a half, so thankfully I fit in that category. So let's get into a little bit of history of the instrument. And so the viola is a direct descendant of the viola de braccio, which is over here on the left. As you can see, we went from a five-string instrument to a four-string instrument. The body of the instrument completely changed size and shape. And, you know, it's actually much easier to play considering we get an actual chin rest. The development of the viola occurred between circa 1530 and 1550 in northern Italy. However, the original design of the instrument went through a massive rework in the 19th century. At the instrument's beginning, it was actually used for both harmony parts. So if you had a string quartet, it would be violin, viola one, viola two, and cello, instead of violin one, violin two, viola, cello, which we have today. Eventually, the practice fell out of usage, but it's a fun fact nonetheless. So when did the viola start taking on its new role? And that would be at the end of the classical era and the beginning of the romantic era. It started to take on a new position. Composers actually started to really uh, quote unquote legitimize the instrument by giving it more challenging and complex solo literature. And with this new flood of compositions, the viola actually started to gain prominence as a solo performing instrument as well. So you've probably been hearing me going Baroque era, classical era, music era, romantic era. What in the world do those mean? Well, I'll be covering those tonight. And I, just to give you some dates as to where these roughly fall, the Baroque era goes from 1580 to 1750, circa, obviously. The classical era is around 1740 to 1820. 
The Romantic era goes t from 1800 to 1910, and the 20th century music goes from 1900 to 2000. And so here are some things to keep in mind when we're talking about musical eras. As you might have noticed, the eras overlap with each other quite frequently with dates. The classical and the Baroque era had about 10 years. The Romantic and the classical era had about 20. And the Romantic and the 20th century had about 10 years as well. These dates are somewhat arbitrary. And there are many composers that cross the boundaries of each era, like one that I'll be performing tonight, Wilhelm Friedemann Bach. Uh, musicians use these classifications, musical eras, more to organize styles and compositional techniques versus time periods. So let's talk about the Baroque era, and we're just going to go in chronological order tonight. So we'll be focusing right now from 1600 to 1750. So what are some characteristics of the Baroque era? Well, frankly, I could not have chosen a more pif perfect picture to depict the Baroque era if I could have, because the Baroque means broken pearl in Portuguese. And that is about as Baroque as you can get. Everything about the Baroque era is about embellishment, about taking it to the next step, about giving it as much grandeur and gilding as possible. During this time, we actually have what we have polyphony, uh, the development of that is very influential during this time. And so polyphony is when you have more than one harmony line at a time. And that's actually very, very different than a lot of the musical eras that came before it because there was only one harmony line before it. During this time, as I've said, uh, embellishments are very common and the melody line is given to the soprano voice. So in the strings, that's the violin instead of the viola right now. Uh, the Baroque era mainly focuses on dance and dance suites when it comes to compositions because there were only really two places that you could go for employment as a musician or composer inside of the Baroque era, the court or the church. So either you were composing stuff for God or you were composing stuff for your lord or lady. And so what did the nobility want to do during this time? Well, they just wanted to go in their highly grandized ballrooms and they wanted to go dance on the dance floor. So composers had to go and compose for that. During the Baroque era as well, we have the explosion of a new genre called opera. It began in Northern Italy circa about 1600 at the very end of the Renaissance. And during this time, composers actually didn't care about who they gave the aria voice to. The aria inside of an opera is the solo uh, big moment of the opera for one or maybe two characters. And during this time, they didn't care whether or not they gave it to the soprano voice, the alto voice, the tenor voice, the baritone, the bass, etc. And so since they were giving arias to alto singers, composers actually started to make that correlation between the alto singers to the alto instruments. And during this time, you started to somewhat see some solo repertoire for the viola, but it didn't really go anywhere. Uh, Inside of the Baroque era as well, you have fugues, and these are very important. It's when you have one musical idea that's, uh, that you have at the beginning of a piece, and then it is repeated throughout that whole entire piece, and you get uh, a whole entire composition based off of it. And some notable composers from the Baroque era are Bach, Vivaldi, and Handel. Now, unfortunately, I have to talk about another, uh, another era before we get to when I actually play. Uh, so right now, we're going to take a trip through the classical era as well. So here are some characteristics of the classical era. The classical era, mathematics was king, and so was repetition. These composers were absolutely convinced that math was the key to everything inside of their compositions. They even made sure that they had eight bar phrases or four bar phrases repeated however many times that they think that it would need to get the musical idea across. During this time, counterpoint is employed throughout fugues and other means as well. Uh, and what counterpoint is, is that that one musical idea that I talked about at the beginning of the fugue, well, then another one gets inserted into the fugue, and that's how we call it counterpoint, because there's another idea countering the original inside of the fugue. 
During the classical era, we turn away from the embellishments of the Baroque era. They believed that the Baroque era was too much, too heavy, and so they actually focused more on lighter harmonies and not as much aggrandizement of their literature. This is also when we really start to see the development of major solo viola works. However, the composers were very few and far between. S and including those composers, it, they do include Mozart, Haydn, and Schubert. And so now, you know, going off of classical and Baroque, we really gotta talk about Bach, now don't we? He's my first composer. Oh, no, sorry, no, not you. That's the father, I need to get to the son. So, here is Wilhelm Friedemann Bach. He was born in 1710 and died in 1784. He was considered to be one of the most prominent composers transitioning the classical and Baroque eras. He was a talented improvisationist. He inherited so many of his father's manuscripts after J.S. Bach's death in 1750. He eventually left court life in 1764 and didn't find any meaningful employment afterwards. He's tried to support himself through teaching, but unfortunately he died relatively unknown and impoverished. However, one of his students went on to teach another student who taught Mendelssohn. And Mendelssohn instituted the Bach revival, and the Bach revival is about the works of J.S. Bach. So you can say that Wilhelm Friedemann actually secured his father's legacy by teaching the students in a line that you can trace all the way back to Mendelssohn. And so now I am going to stop talking because I'm pretty sure you want that to happen. And we are going to listen to, uh, my bad, I have to talk about the piece first. Ah, brain needs to work. So the viola duet number two in G minor it was suspected to be composed during his time in Berlin, and they are signed and dated in 1775, which is when he was in Berlin trying to be in the court of Princess Anna, who was the sister of Otto von Bismarck. It has three movements. Repetition is used in both the first and the second movement, which as we saw was a classical era technique, and the third movement is a just grand fugue which we saw in the Baroque era. And the most commonly held theory is that Bach wrote this piece as a teaching etude. So now <laughs> we are going to play the duet. So I would like to invite Rick Smallshaw to the stage and we will perform this piece for you.
God if ever I saw one. But thank you, Rick, so much for doing that with me. So now, on to more boring stuff, right? So here we are going on to the Romantic era, which is from 1800 to 1910. So let's talk about a couple of characteristics during this time period. There are two schools of composition, the absolute school and the programmatic school, or as they like to call it, the old school and new school of music. During this time, absolute music meant music composed just for music's sake. It was literally anything and everything that you, the listener, wanted to think about it was okay. And programmatic music was when a composer told you what that piece was going to be about, and it had a specific goal in mind. During this era, there are many new genres, and I could go on and on and on listing all of them. However, I did not have enough PowerPoint slide or breath capacity to do so. So the biggest one that everybody might know is the symphonic overture. Uh, it is used heavily throughout this era, and it is one of the most common. During this era, we saw the advanced and increased use of chromaticism, and during this time, you saw a development of harmony that had not been seen before in Western music. We actually now have polyphony back. Look at that. But as I said before, musical eras are critiques of each other, and the Romantic era looked at the classical era and said, Mm, no, I want polyphony back. And so they added it, but yet what did they do versus the Baroque era? They added even more. And during this time, in that polyphony, we started to get these unconventional instruments that would start to have that melody line. And the viola is one of those <laughs> unconventional instruments. One of the biggest proponents of giving the viola the melody in the Romantic era was none other than Ludwig van Beethoven himself, which along with Beethoven, some of the other notable composers of the Romantic era include Tchaikovsky, Mahler, Wagner, and Schubert. So, as I've been doing, doing that throughout this whole entire time, I've been giving you composers beforehand, however, I haven't been giving you the one that I'm talking about. And the next composer on the next piece that I'm playing is Johannes Brahms. And he was born in 1833 and died in 1897. As you can see, he lived a very long and full life. He, is, he was a prominent pianist, conductor, and composer. He was originally from Hamburg, Germany, but spent most of his professional career in Vienna, Austria. And during this time, he would routinely tour Europe. And one of his favorite things to do was take a trip down to Italy, which he did seven times throughout the course of his life. He officially retired in 1891, and I put retire in air quotes because, as you can see, he wrote the sonatas, which uh, one of them I will be performing for you tonight, in 1894, after he was supposedly done with work. He was a notorious perfectionist, and unfortunately what happened is that when he died, he left instructions in his will for all of his unfinished works to be destroyed. And so thankfully, Clara Schumann, who was in charge of that task, managed to save a few of them. However, we, the rough estimates are about 90% of all unfinished compositions by Brahms were lost due to this notorious perfectionist nature of Brahms. And during his life, he was considered both a traditionalist and an innovator throughout the Romantic era. And I'm gonna talk about that more when I talk about this next piece. So the, piece that I'm, the second piece I'm performing for you tonight is the Sonata Opus 120, number one in F minor, movement one. Yeah, that's a mouthful, but you know what? It's worth it. So this follows traditional sonata form compositional practices. It has an exposition in the beginning, a development, and then a recapitulation. Or, as we like to say in the musical form and theory analysis world, it has an A section, and then it has a B section, and then it has either the A section or it has an A prime section, which means that it's like the A section, just slightly different. Going off of this, in the development, there is a key change in which we go from four flats to four sharps. That is very common practice in sonata form and inside of, basic, uh, inside of a lot of romantic literature as well. It was originally written for the clarinet, but Brahms transposed the parts to viola 
himself. Now, you have some quibbling throughout the academic circles about exactly why he did this, but the most commonly held theory is that he transposed these parts just in case his clarinetist, Richard Muhlfeld, became incapacitated for any sort of reason. And so I think that's enough talking about this piece. And I would like to invite Rachel onto the stage, and we will perform Sonata Opus 120, number one, in F minor, movement one.
I get to talk about the final piece of my recital tonight. And that piece takes place in the 20th century era. So what are some characteristics of that era? The rules have gone out the window. Well, mostly. There are still some, however, during this era, any compositional practices or styles that you had with the previous eras really do just evaporate. You do have things like 12-tone polytonality, atonality, and pandiasonicism with regards to harmony, and those are just fancy music speak of increased chromaticism. Uh, you have the increased usage of modes as well, which also plays into the chromatic efforts as well. The genres of neoclassicism and minimalism also appear in this era. Neoclassicism means going back to the classical era style, uh, and minimalism is actually doing the least amount possible. And the best piece that I can give for minimalism is John Cage 433. And my music friends will know what that means. However, for the general public, John Cage 433 is when a person goes to a piano, sits down, and just sits there for four minutes and 33 seconds in silence. And that is the most minimalist piece I can ever think of. Some more genres that came out of this era include blues, jazz, rock and roll, disco, hip hop, R&B, and so many others. Anything that came into fruition in, the, in between 1900 and 2000 is considered 20th century music. And during this era, nationalism and music shared a bond. Now, we did see the rise of nationalistic music throughout the Romantic era. However, that was more just based off of the country or place that you were from. You would compose songs about England. You would compose songs about France, Germany, Russia, Italy. However, during this time, it was used for far different purposes. And unfortunately, one of those purposes was used for absolute horror by the Nazis and their empire. But, uh, and some notable composers from this era include Shostakovich, Stravinsky, and Aaron Copland. However, we're gonna talk about one man that actually escaped from Nazi Germany. Paul Hindemith was born in 1895 and died in 1963. He was born in Germany, but immigrated to the US when the Nazis came to political power. However, before that, he was a soldier in World War I for the German Empire under, uh, during that time. He was sent to the Belgian front, and during his time on the front lines, he actually wrote in his diary that the only reason that he survived the war was because he was lucky the grenade did not land next to him instead of his comrades. After World War I, he moved back to Germany and married Gertrude Rothenberg in 1924. The couple fled to Switzerland in 1938 due to Gertrude's part Jewish ancestry. And as you might be aware, under German law, anybody who had any Jewish ancestry inside of their family was automatically considered a non-German citizen and available for deportation to concentration and work camps. Eventually, the couple moved to the United States in 1940, where Paul Hindemith now began his illustrious teaching career, and he actually gained prominence by teaching at one of our most prestigious universities in the country, Yale University, teaching music, history, and composition. Hindemith and his wife became United States citizens in 1946. However, they didn't stay for very long because they immigrated back to Europe in 1953 with their American citizenship still intact. During his life, Hindemith was one of the most vocal advocates for the viola and for the composition of viola and preparing and uh, giving violists more repertoire and practice and encouragement throughout this era. And so one of those pieces is Traumusik, which I'll be performing later tonight. However, I'm going to talk about the history of the piece and give you some context, because that's what I love to do. Hendemuth was supposed to perform Der Schwanendreher, which means, quite literally, the swan turner. It was his most recent viola concerto based off of a mix 
of German folk music. And he was set to prepare the British premiere for the piece on January 22nd, 1936 with the British Broadcasting Company in Queen's Hall, I believe. However, there's a snag. King George V died just before midnight on January 20th, 1936. And Hindemith had to completely change tactics because the cultural practices of the time is that no new premieres of works can happen during the mourning period of the country unless it is about the death of the king. So what did Hindemith do? Well, he spent the whole entire next day locked in a BBC office writing a piece for viola and string orchestra. And I actually read a quote somewhere that someone called this a Mozartian <laughs> effort. And it's actually quite a feat. As I said, the piece was written for solo, viola, and string orchestra. However, tonight it will just be myself and a pianist. And it is a mix between A minor, but also a tonality. And so it's, it's interesting in that it seems that it has no tonal center, but in reality, it does. And during the composition of this piece, Hindemith took inspiration from the hymn, Für dienen Thron trägt ich Hamit. And at, at this moment in time, I forget the rough translation. However, it is, it is going to the throne and submitting to the will of God. And he used this for his fourth movement without even knowing that this was actually a very, very prominent British hymn at the time which made it even more significant to the mourning of King George V. And so now I would like to perform Trau Music, or the English translation, Music of Mourning for You.
Isn't that just such a beautiful piece where you can just hear the musical expression of grief? So going on from now, what is the significance of everything that I've told you tonight? Well, in my opinion, delving into the research on pieces that you're playing can also inform a performer to what type of artistic expression they need to take. I also believe they will help to encourage performers to help understand uh, and gain further understanding of their pieces and instruments as well. And knowing the differences between the eras and how the stylistic, uh, the stylistic changes happened over time will ultimately help performers become better players as well. And so at this time, I would like to say thank you to every single person on this slide. Firstly, to Mr. Joe Nigro for being my teacher for these past five years and my partner in lessons and in crime sometimes. <laughs> and it's been a wild ride, but I've enjoyed every single moment of it. I'd like to thank Ms. Rachel Kowinski for being a fantastic accompanist and for joining me on this venture. And also to Rick, over there for willingly stepping up and doing this duet with me three weeks before <laughs> the recital because we had something come up. I'd also like to thank Mr. Louis Donato, wherever in the world he is in this room, uh, but he has been a stalwart boss and friend throughout my time here and I love him to bits. I'd also like to thank Dr. F. Johnson Scott, Dr. Cynthia Ramsey, and Dr. Cara Dean for being there throughout all of my coursework, throughout all of the breakdowns, throughout all the triumphs as well, and the previous <laughs> research in which I know that I gave Dr. Ramsey many headaches about. Um, but I love each and every single one of them, and I cannot be more grateful to the guidance that I received under them. And I just would like to also just thank every single one of them in the music department, faculty, and staff. So hang on, we're not done yet. I could have done this presentation and I could have given you boring chordal fugal analyses. I could have done sonata uh, form an foreign analysis. And I could have gone into the entire depth of a 12 tone row. However, I figured that was too boring for this presentation, which I was already going to consider boring you to death anyways, talking about all of the musical eras. So I just wanted to give you my reasoning for why I did this project. And this next quote from Beethoven really says it all for me. Don't only practice your art, but force your way into its secrets. Art deserves that, for it and knowledge can raise men to the divine. And I can safely say that I would not have been as artistic and as knowledgeable about these pieces as I would have been if I had not done all of this research and all of this work into this. And I can safely say that it has made me a better performer and musician. So I would like to thank each and every single one of you inside of my audience, well, uh, audience, and virtually as well, who have willingly listened to me talk for an hour. And at that, I am going to conclude my senior lecture recital. Thank you all for coming. It has been a pleasure.